Welcome everyone to this week in the health corner. Today we're dealing with neck pain and we have the privilege to invite the specialist physiotherapist who had featured on this show, uh, Mr. Sham Chati, to share his knowledge about the common causes of neck pain and some of the things we can do to help ourselves. Welcome to Health Corner, Mr. Shamchati. Thank you, Doctor. I know neck pain is very common in the community. Um, a lot of people wake up in the morning and they tell you, Oh, Doctor, I didn't know what I did. I can't move my neck. And you see them, to move their neck, they have to move the part of their body. But that's the acute one, the one that just happened. But there are other conditions as well, which are not as acute as sudden neck pain. Do you mind talking us through some of the neck pain you encounter in your clinical practice? Yes, doctor. Thank you uh, once again for the opportunity. And um, it was a pleasure to be here back at, the, um, at uh, this venue to, to speak about this uh, neck issues. Um, as you rightly said, we get a lot of uh, patients who have got neck issues. Um, so, uh, Sometimes uh, the, the onset of the pain is sudden, mm. where we call it as acute, where it is just started, where we know exactly when it started. It could be somebody is trying to lift something or somebody fell off watching a television show or a movie which is so boring. Mm -hmm. It could be anything. Or sometimes it is a gradual thing where it happens over sometimes period over a period of months, sometimes years, mm. where it's very gradual, gradual build up. Yes. And then it becomes chronic, where they, they, they actually if you ask them what is the reason for the pain, they sometimes they say no, they don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. it's a, it's a, we call it as insidious or a gradual onset. Gradual onset. So, so there are the two mm -hmm. main uh, reasons for the neck pain. Yeah, and what, what are these reasons? So now, again we spoke about this, this is all to do with our evolutionary perspective uh, because we became uh, two-legged animals from four-legged animals and then we spoke about the back because you can see there is a curvature in the back and so is the curvature in the neck. So because of the curvatures we developed from being a four-legged animals and with the evolutionary per, uh, cycle and we became two-legged. So there is a little bit of more strain uh, as compared to the rest of the spine. In, especially in the neck and the back. Mm -hmm. So it makes it a little bit more disadvantageous in a way, you know, the mm -hmm. neck and back um, pain perspective. So now when you say neck, it is the area that uh, covers between the base of the skull mm -hmm. to the first thoracic vertebra. So when I say thoracic vertebra, this is the most prominent part of the, the, the spine. When, you, mm -hmm. you, when people palpate it, they will feel it. And that is the most significant uh, bony prominence. And below that, below that one is your uh, first thoracic vertebra. And this is the area that we call it as neck. Neck. So mm -hmm. any pain that is in this region um, between the base of the skull to the first thoracic vertebra. And we call it as neck pain. Okay. So if you look at uh, the, the neck pain as such, um, you will see the neck pain in both uh, genders. Uh, both men and women, but uh, the research and the statistics say that women struggle with neck pain a little bit more, neck and shoulder pain, a oh. little bit more than men. So it's more common. Yes, it is. Women. Yes, it is more common, and the main reasons why the women get tend to get more issues with the neck and shoulders, because um, um, because they generally carry a bag and it's more of one side. They, they don't usually, usually men tend to carry a backpack or sometimes they don't have any mm. bag whatsoever. Uh, whereas women, it's more of asymmetrical. There is a symmetry with the bag. Sometimes the bag can be really heavy. 
Um, mm -hmm. Then that causes a lot of uh, strain on that particular side, and that could lead into the neck pain uh, in due course and eventually. Mm -hmm. um, so when we say neck, um, even though the co the topic here is uh, mainly for the neck, but uh, actually, as a matter of fact, we can't uh, differentiate between the neck and shoulders. Um, mm. The reason why I'm saying this is uh, when we see people uh, in the clinic with the neck pain, we always have to assess the shoulder just to make sure that it is not coming from the shoulder because they're very close to each other. Mm. Um, and sometimes it's referred to as a neck and shoulder complex. Um, so we can't just differentiate between just the neck pain or shoulder pain. It's mm. actually a combination of both. So, and uh, this is uh, usually because uh, of uh, the, the rhythm that your shoulder and the neck you know, plays with. And when you do a certain movement, there is an uh, involvement of uh, the whole of the spine, but mainly the neck and shoulders. Mm. That, that's why they're very close to, uh, really very close to each other. Um, so now, when you look at all the musculoskeletal conditions, mm. all the musculoskeletal conditions, now, which people struggle for years uh, and that live with disability and uh, usually the shoulder and neck problems are comes in the first category right uh, so any muscular condi uh, musculoskeletal conditions that leads to disability and in that category your neck and shoulder pain is definitely the, the, the foremost one the problem right. where you get lots of people affecting with uh, the neck and shoulders so issues. they are more common uh, than the back pain Yes, in a way, because uh, we will go to why it is like that, because mm -hmm. when you look at the neck, um, so we spoke about this is a combination of seven uh, bones, mm -hmm. one stacked on, on top of each other. It's not straight like this, so there is a curvature. Mm -hmm. We call it as lordosis is a curvature. So because of this neck, and you see as compared to the back, uh, you've got relatively uh, larger group of muscles supporting the back, mm -hmm. whereas the neck, if you look at the neck as such, it is actually very, looks like insignificant, but it's very important. I'm saying this is uh, with specific emphasis because you've got the head where the brain is uh, encased mm. and this brain communicates with the rest of the body through the neck. Right. And there's lots of nerves, all the nerves as a matter of fact, uh, coming yes. from the brain actually goes through the neck to uh, the rest of the body. So does it have to do with the neck having more movement than the rest of the spine? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right, yes. And the neck uh, has got relatively more movement as mm -hmm. compared to the lumbar spine or lower back. And that's also one of the main reasons why the neck pain um, is more uh, common. And uh, so if you look at the neck itself, it is purely controlled by or uh, stabilized by the muscles surrounding it. So, because it's very closely works with the shoulder as well, so any kind of uh, muscle imbalance, mm. if they happen, it can easily happen in your neck and shoulder area. Mm. Right. So now, with uh, the main causes, again, uh, we spoke about the two uh, reasons why the pain would start, which is acute, which is mm. sudden onset, and chronic, which is, happens over a period of time. So the causes could be, again, lots of causes. One is postural, mm -hmm. where how a person um, sits uh, in front of the computer or in, in the office, how long they actually spend in that particular position. And that will make uh, the neck uh, predisposed to a lot of strain. Mm -hmm. And that could easily happen in the neck, generally. Mm -hmm. So when we say neck, not just neck symptoms of neck pain, when we, we have got stiffness or um, when you have got pain, when you move your neck, most often people say there will be some clicking that mm -hmm. happens when they move the neck. There will be uh, a significant click that happens when they move the neck. So that clicking, the viewers will be wondering, what is it that causes the clicking? So this, um, if you look at uh, the anatomical design of mm -hmm. uh, how the human mechanism is, is a fabulous, fantastic design as such. So now we spoke about seven bones stacked on top of each other and these bones are connected with each other with two joints on mm -hmm. either side. Usually in the middle of the spine you've got the bones and you've got on either sides you've got the joints. Mm -hmm. So these joints need to click. They, they are actually perfectly aligned and uh, precision with precision. Mm -hmm. So which means that if I'm doing this, which means that the joint gets into in the right time mm -hmm. at the right, uh, you know, in the, in, when you look at the biomechanics, it's actually absolutely spot on. All of them work absolutely in harmony. So when this harmony is disturbed, 
it could be as we said about the muzzle imbalance where one muzzle group is too tight and it's pulling to one side and then if it is pulling to one side naturally when this goes into clicking and it doesn't click straight away it actually finds its way mm -hmm. rather than going straight into the the joint into the joint so the the there's a slight amount of mismatch mm. because of the muzzle over pull where over activity on one side and under activity on the other side mm -hmm. and that would cause um, a little bit of a click it, it it still gets into the space the right right place mm. but it takes a there's a little bit of hesitation so the click in is not dangerous no definitely not dangerous mm. so most of the times clicking can be um, treated in the sense if you bring about a balance if you uh, take care of the imbalance if you bring about a balance between the two groups of muscles I'm mm. talking about two groups I'm talking about referring to the right side and the left side if you bring about a balance in other words if one muscle group is tight you stretch it and other muscle group is weak and you strengthen it mm. if you bring about a balance and suddenly I have seen in so many occasions where the clicking uh, is, is, is naturally disappears now we'll be talking about what to do in the second segment so we'll continue so now we're talking about the insidious neck pain that starts gradually over months, years, and then you know the sudden one that people wake up with. Yeah. So what is the likely cause of the one that people wake up with suddenly and they can't move their neck and they are very worried? Uh, doctor, it's mainly, if you look at lots of reasons, but the main reason is the way the people sleep. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a lot of research uh, in terms of how to sleep, how to look after the neck. Let's put a simple example. If I've uh, slept like in a, on a sofa, like on a certain day, or if I um, slept uh, uh, not in my usual place, in somebody else's place or something like that. So we got to take into consideration of for small things. So let's say if I actually slept like this, with my head tilted because it could be a smaller pillow, where it's not in line, my neck is, mm. the head is not in line with my rest of the body. So all night long, my head has been like this. Mm. So now if you could see what's happening is, these muzzles are in a tightened position, shortened mm. position, all night long. So now eight hours, or it depends upon how long a person is sleeping. It could be 10 hours, it could be a little bit more. Now, all this time, these muzzles have been in a shortened position, mm. and these muzzles have been in a very, really elongated mm. position. Mm -hmm. And now when suddenly your body is accommodated, adjusted to that position and suddenly when you wake up in the morning it feels like awkward because it, it doesn't feel right because you, you can feel one muzzle, one side. They can always, they always say which side is tight because the, that is quite uh, straightforward mm -hmm. um, you know, in order for the person who is experiencing it. They will know exactly which side and they will always say that side is, the muzzle is tight. So the muzzle that is painful is the one that is tight, not the one that is stretched. That's right. A muzzle mm -hmm. that is painful is the one that is being tight and in, into a spasm. Mm -hmm. it, it's gone into a spasm and now if you wanted to straighten it, straighten it, which means that you need to, mm -hmm. need to have some kind of a force to stretch it back to its place. Mm -hmm. So when people doesn't know when there is a pain involved and they are very reluctant to stretch it out. Um, right. Sometimes, you know, we could actually get that neck stretched gradually, mm. slowly and gradually, so that we can get the imbalance right. Mm. Uh, for many of us, it happens on a day-to-day -day basis. Yes. Sometimes we don't pay much attention because it settles down by itself. Yes. So only when it doesn't settle down, it has gone into really tired spasm, and then uh, they've gone, uh, got up, and then, of course, the life has to move on, yes. and they've gone to work, and they actually sat on the chair, and then in the same position without mm. taking care of it, mm. then it could actually build up to a point where it can become really uh, yes. annoying. And this can be very common. So That's fun. right. Fantastic. Okay. Sure. Yes, so, yeah. so now the relevance of this neck pain, if you see because of uh, the lockdown as well, and many people are working from home. So it's, uh, for some of them, it's actually okay to work from home because mm. the same work can be done from home. But if you look at the, the disadvantage of this is, now is the, the workstation is really set up for their purpose, for their mm -hmm. needs or not. Sometimes you, I, I can see my physio colleagues as well, they actually sit down and uh, put uh, the laptop on their lap or somewhere else and, 
it's not been looked at properly mm. system you know in a, in, a, in a scientific way so when i say scientific way you know all this your posture needs to be a certain level um, for your neck and your back and the whole spine to be at ease if it is at ease mm. then we don't have any issues we don't have any stress developing but if your body is not at ease if your neck uh, your spine is not at ease or your neck is not at ease then it will result into some kind of a muscle imbalances either direct immediately or over a period of time mm. um, and uh, sometimes it is uh, the poor posture of uh, the, the person actually mm. contributes to the neck pain mm. so when i say this uh, what i mean is um, so we all know that your whole spine needs to be straight uh, your shoulders uh, should be in line with your ear lobes so that is usually a, a, mm. a a guideline that we use to say how how the posture has changed mm. sometimes people who are forward uh, bending either if they are looking down for their as part of their job or if they are actually in, in front of the computer all the time if you could look the neck is always forward mm. when it is always forward and then your neck will get adjusted to that level mm. and then which means that they will end up in having the shoulders Uh, mm. because at the end of the day your body will be at ease when your ear lobes and your shoulders are in one plane mm. one line so because your head is gone forward then as a compensation they will end up in having rounded shoulders mm. so rounded shoulders means you've got tightness in the muscles in the front of your chest and you've got elongated and weak muscles at the back so this is a cycle a vicious cycle that mm. keeps going on and on mm. so we need to address that uh, as soon as possible to prevent it becoming a chronic a long term problem mm. and uh, we spoke about the ergonomics uh, which is um, uh, how uh, how much of energy that is required to do your work if you could minimize the amount of energy that you could that you're using to do the same amount of work and that becomes ergonomics ergonomics is about the chair how the chair is placed where the keyboard is how how far, how where the the screen is kept how your neck is positioned when you're doing it and how your fingers and hands are positioned so the ergonomics is that the reason why people gradually develop uh, what they call spondylosis you know it's very common as well and again people who are involved in road traffic accident they don't get any pain but two a day or two after they come with their neck they call it whiplash is that all uh, connected to ergonomics no Yes it's uh, if you look at the road traffic accident which you can I I we encounter a lot in the clinic mm. um so road traffic accident or whiplash where there is a sudden movement of the neck mm. and when this happens where your muscles will have to react mm. to the situation so when i say react they don't ask for your permission they will go into tightness spasm mm. so because of the adrenaline when this whole mm-hmm. thing happens and things like that you might many many times people say the pain is actually started after 24 hours or after yeah. 48 hours that is usually the trend where your muscles gone into spasm and when the people only feel it when the adrenaline comes down or mm-hmm. when when they have to when the f- f- muscle spasm really sets in and that mm-hmm. is when they feel the restriction to all the symptoms of pain right. and all the limitation to the neck range of motion and everything so whiplash is due to muscle spasms that are that's oh. right so this muscle again it is to the extent of the whiplash sometimes this joints are also involved um this is all combination if the muscles are tight for longer period of time mm. and that means that that doesn't let the joints move much right. when the joints don't move much and there will be some stiffness right So it's mainly a muscle issue but mm. it could actually result into a joint related issue right. in due course of time. So mm. uh, as soon as we have some input intervention mm. so that we could we could disturb this uh, the vicious cycle as yes. quickly as possible. Right. So the joint related condition of the neck is it the one that we call spondylosis or arthritis? Yes doctor. So spondyl- spondylosis it means uh, degenerative changes in the mm. joint. So this degeneration generally the common word for this is wear and tear wear and tear changes wear yes. and tear no. so the wear and tear is not naturally happens for everyone but they are very uh, they are very significant and we can clearly see after mm. the fifth their fifth decade generally the, that is when um, where the wear and tear becomes significant where people actually recognize it right okay 
viewers, um, if you're just joining, we've just been talking about neck pain. And the professional dealing with this is Mr. Sham Chati. So we'll bring the first segment to an end. We're going to start the second segment where you will hear from the professional what to do if you have neck pain. Thank you and stay tuned. Welcome back to the second segment of today's Health Corner. We've been talking about causes of neck pain and we have the professional, Mr. Shamshati, who has been explaining the different types of neck pain. If you're just joining us, this second segment is going to talk about the things we can do at home by ourselves or when to look for support or when to seek the health professional to help us out if you have these symptoms. Mr. Shati, thank you again for throwing very good light on the different types of neck pain. And now, I know the audience will be listening. What is it that we should do if you just wake up in the morning and you can't move your neck because it hurts. Is there anything we could do is it with our bed or with our pillows? Now you've talked about the ears and the shoulder being on the same plane. There are quite a few things that we do wrong that gives us neck pain. What would be your advice to our viewers? Sure. So the first thing uh, is uh, we have to understand where the, the symptom, where the, uh, where the discomfort com is coming from. So we have seen, because this muzzle has been in the same contracted position all night long. Mm. So when, what this means is your muzzle fibers have slid into each other mm. so much, more than what it should be. So that it always leaves less gap between the muzzle fibers, where all the blood vessels also pass through. When the blood vessels have got less space and they mm. get suffocated, and which means the same amount of blood is not flowing through. So there is an element of blood circulation issue there, where mm -hmm. your muscles are not getting the blood circulation. Mm -hmm. They're tight and they're not getting blood circulation. Mm -hmm. And now we know this uh, fact that uh, the pain is caused by chemicals. If the chemicals are being accumulated in that muscle and without increasing the blood circulation, the pain is not going to go that mm -hmm. quickly. So in other words, if we, we can do something to improve the blood circulation, and that's the first thing that we need to do. Mm -hmm. Many times, even before they even get to a doctor or a physio, they tend to do, they will actually rub it themselves. And that's a very good thing that we could do. That's massage. Then. Massage, yes. Mm. So when you do the massage, what you're trying to do is to try to move the tight muscle fibers away from each other. Mm. Okay. And of course, you are actually converting some of the mechanical energy to improve the blood circulation to the muscle. So that is something that we could do immediately. That is, that is not a, a big, uh, it doesn't cause any complications mm -hmm. for people. Or we could actually also give a sustained source of the heat. In other words, it could be um, a, a hot water bottle or it could be, uh, nowadays you have got the weed bag, uh, which mm. people put in the microwave and take it and put it around the neck and shoulders. Mm. Um, and that will really help. The water bottle can't stay, so which means that you have to either hold it or mm. keep it that way. But uh, the weed bag is long, so it actually covers nicely. It wraps around the neck and shoulders quite nicely. Some viewers asked, um, what about cold compress? Does uh, that help in this case? No, the cold compression is actually a line of treatment for the joint. Mm. So if the joint, if it's not because they will woke up because a muzzle gone tight. So if the muzzle is gone tight, the line mm. of treatment would be a better uh, choice would be the heat mm. um, that increases the blood circulation that is solving the problem then and there. But if the joint is inflamed, mm. let's say um, somebody has got arthritis uh, or spondylitis, mm. where this is not a muzzle issue, this mm. is a joint issue, mm. where your joint is actually struggling because of the wear and tear, mm. because of the, the little cushion in the joint. Mm. 
is not working or is it actually worn out. Right. So when the joint is inflamed or irritate, uh, irritable, it's quite mm. irritable, it's, it's not happy. Mm. So in that case, usually you apply a cold compression that will work really, really well. Mm. So now viewers will be wondering, how do I decide the heat or cold? Mm -hmm. So generally when the joint is inflamed or there is inflammation changes or when there is irritable, it's quite irritable uh, where it's not happy then usually if you feel the temperature of where, how the joint is mm -hmm. as compared to the other side you could actually see a difference with the temperature where mm -hmm. the, the raised temperature mm -hmm. when the raised temperature is there naturally we wanted to reduce the temperature and that is when we could naturally use uh, the cold compression so that mm -hmm. the heightened response would actually be set, you're settling down that response mm -hmm. whereas if it is a muzzle related issue where the muzzle mm -hmm. feels like this is actually really tight muzzle mm -hmm then uh, the use of the heat would definitely work very well in, in our favor. Right. So now I wanted to also bring something to notice to the viewers. Now if you apply the heat, mm -hmm. your muscles are a little bit relaxed. But once effective heat is gone, the muscle, because of the muscle memory, it will go back to square one. Right. So by applying the heat, the, the heat works as a window of opportunity mm -hmm. for us to be able to move the joint fully. Mm -hmm. So you put the heat, it's like heat works as a preparation for us to be able to do some exercises. The exercises, just normal stretching. So when you say stretching without making it complicated, if you could move your neck without moving the rest of the body to full range in all planes, so that is one plane and that's the second plane and looking up and looking down is third plane. If you could do all the full movements in all the ind individual movements in all the three planes, if, if after the heat, if you could do that, mm. and you're not only increasing the blood circulation, making the muscle happy, so that your muscle is working for you, not against you. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, some people uh, with neck pain um, buy this neck brace. Does that help in any way? Now, the neck, uh, we, the, the whole purpose is to facilitate movement. Mm. By applying a collar, Yes, it is indicated on a certain conditions, specific conditions. Mm. It is indicated. But when there is a neck instability, that it will be um, assessed by a professional. Mm. When there is a neck instability, immobilizing the neck with a neck collar would, would work really very well. That's fine. Mm. But we don't want to, for normal common neck issues, we don't want to put a collar. Mm. Or in other words, without proper professional advice, we definitely don't want to put a collar because it actually uh, stops the pain. Mm -hmm. uh, it stops the pain, but it also makes the joint, it restricts the joint. Then we have to deal with that problem later on. Right, okay, because it gives them psychological support initially, but it's actually not um, yeah, advisable to that's right. wear the neck collar. That's right, doctor. If it is indicated, if mm -hmm. there is an instability and it's been assessed by the uh, physiotherapist, mm -hmm. then yes, it is advisable, then that's fine. So what about sleeping? I mean, mattress or pillows, does that help in any way? Yes, doctor, definitely. That's a very good point. Um, mattresses, they have got a lifespan. Usually mm -hmm. the general recommendation or from the research point of view as well, usually eight years is the general lifespan of the mattress, depending upon the mattress, of course. Mm -hmm. okay. Beyond the eight years, it actually loses its ability to support us. Mm -hmm. So generally, on a, on a general uh, rule, after eight years, we should think about uh, changing, changing the mattress. our mattresses. So um, we will talk about the pillows because you did mention about the pillow. Pillows play a significant role. Many times, I actually I see people who are we see in the clinic, and they actually don't know how to use a pillow. Mm. So now I will talk about a few things, simple things here, um, and also one more point: how to sleep, so that that will uh, contribute to how to look after your neck in a way. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to pillows, so the way that we, because you need to choose the right pillow for you mm -hmm. in terms of thickness. Some, mm -hmm. some people say, oh, should I wear, take one pillow or two pillow? It's not about that. It's about this. If I stand against the wall with my shoulder to the wall and if I look straight, if I introduce a pillow and that should touch, the pillow should touch my ear. So mm -hmm. that means that that is the right pillow for me. Mm -hmm. If I introduce a pillow, when I'm standing like this with my shoulder against the wall, mm -hmm. with my neck straight, if mm -hmm. I introduce a pillow, if there's a gap between the pillow and my ear, 
that's not a good good pillow for me we mm -hmm. should not not use it we, which means that if it is if there is a gap which means that my neck has to be in that position mm -hmm. and we spoke about this in the first say, uh, uh, part of the, the this conversation mm -hmm. that we don't want neck to be in that position either forward position or backward position or in the sideways position throughout the night so we wanted to absolutely make sure that the gap whatever the gap between mm -hmm. the shoulder and the neck and the head the side of the head so this pillow is meant to cover the gap mm -hmm. so that your head feels supported in the neutral position so that is something that we just find it really useful now we we also wanted to emphasize I, I wanted to emphasize the fact that the pillow ideally when it is used it should cover the neck and the shoulders mm -hmm. so in other words the top of the pillow should be at the top of the head and it should come down mm -hmm. to cover the neck and shoulders mm -hmm. and I, I also see people tend to put the head in the middle of the pillow mm -hmm. ideally we should keep it to the to one end and then use the rest of the pillow to support the arm to keep mm -hmm. the arm rested so it's always better to keep uh, the head to one end of the pillow and use the rest of the pillow to support the arm in that way mm -hmm. and um, many times people sometimes people sleep on their tummy um, and there's a lot of research says to say that that is not a good practice to do so one simple thing is when I'm say, sleeping on my tummy I have to keep my neck out of the way mm -hmm. so again this means that these muscles are getting stretched and that muscles are being tight mm -hmm. all night long and of course there is a there is a lot of constant pressure uh, on the organs mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't help in the long run and um, sometimes people tend to do this I've seen that so many times sometimes people put their hand under their head like mm -hmm. this and uh, the research uh, clearly proving that this particular position if it is stayed all night long that could predispose somebody to have a frozen shoulder because mm -hmm. what happens is because you're keeping that shoulder in that position all the muscles needs to be working and they're getting tighter to protect the joint mm. and when that becomes overprotective and then we call it as a frozen shoulder the medical term for this is uh, adhesive capsulitis mm. where it becomes really all the capsule and everything mm. becomes really tight, tight. and mm. that could predispose to further mm. uh, uh, shoulder related yeah, issues right. right i know we're going to talk about shoulder in the next show right um what about uh, the next spondylosis um, uh, we have a lot of neck arthritis. It obviously, you mentioned that it usually starts from 50. Can people who are younger than 50 still have that? It can, ha it can definitely happen. Um, I have seen in the clinic some um, people who play rugby because there's an impact sport and they would have actually strained. Their, there's a lot of stress on the neck. So wherever there is an injury, they mm. will be wear and tear. Mm. Wherever there is an injury. Mm. If somebody played sport, and then they hurt their neck generally wear and tear mm. and then they will the, the the wear and tear happens much more quickly right um, so now the the question is what what we need to do mm. when you have got the arthritis related neck mm. what should we do yes. so now we one thing we said about improving the blood circulation by using the heat that mm. can't go wrong definitely mm. Yes, if uh, the doctor, um, the GP has prescribed their medication, so they could take that definitely mm -hmm. because they will work quite very well together. As uh, people are getting used to the physical agents, then naturally the need to take painkillers will naturally come down. Mm -hmm. So that's something. And now this wear and tear also happens. Let's say if the joint has got that much of movement. Mm -hmm. If I'm not moving to full range, I'm only moving to that range. Mm -hmm. So whatever the joint space that is not being used becomes unusable. Mm -hmm. And we simply call it as arthritis. Mm -hmm. So in other words, whatever the joint range we have, we should make sure that we are able to move the joint to the full range possible. Okay. Now, if, if, so, if someone comes down with arthritis because he hasn't been moving the joints in full range, is there any neck exercises to do to bring the joint back to full range? Yes, doctor. Mm -hmm. So now, like every everything else, you need preparation. Even mm -hmm. exercises, before you do the exercises, you need the right preparation. Mm -hmm. The preparation is generally by using the heat, uh, applying the hot water bottle, or generally take a bath or shower, and then you come within 10 minutes if they time their exercises, and they will get maximum benefit out of those exercises. So the exercises... The simple exercises mm. are 
very simple and we wanted to make sure that the neck is if uh, let's say if I've got a limitation beyond that range on one side so I wanted to make sure the first thing that we wanted to make sure that there is no compensation mm. in other words the other joints are not helping this joint mm. if the other joints are helping naturally what this means is uh, this joint get uh, comfortable and then it will stay in that position it never gets a chance to get better mm. so in other words if I wanted to move my neck to that range, I could keep my uh, trunk against the wall. So I have a reference where I'm not moving my trunk. I could uh, stand with my back to the wall and now I could move my neck. If I'm moving till, till that moment and beyond that it is a little bit more tighter or it's not possible, I could gently use my other hand to do a gentle pressure on that area so that to get a little bit of more movement possible. Mm. If uh, we can't move ourselves, we could use the, the use of the hand. So if there is a proper restriction and, uh, and there are certain physiotherapic techniques uh, we use in the clinic to improve uh, where we passively mobilize the joint, mm. make sure that the joint is working properly. So what you call passive, it means assisting the joint by, you know, helping with your hand? Exactly, to yes. To increase the movement. That's right. Do you, do you know how many times in a day would you advise someone to do these neck exercises? Now, we don't want to, especially when the, the joint is really um, uh, ir irritated, uh, we don't want to do too many times, but ideally twice a day mm -hmm. is generally a good practice and it should not uh, be too much for the joint to uh, deal with this. Um, now, how many repetitions um, that is subjective mm -hmm. to indi individual? Generally, we the general concept is to do 10 repetitions as one set, three mm -hmm. sets of them. That's the usual thing. But sometimes some people, when they're struggling to do this, they might not be able to do this many. Mm -hmm. Then we could e either reduce the number of sets or number of the repetitions in each set. So does that work for people with whiplash? Um, whiplash is mainly, first of all, we have to overcome that muscle spasm first mm -hmm. to get into the joint. So mm -hmm. the, it's more of acute condition where we could get the results much more quickly in whiplash, put mm -hmm. it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, we could facilitate uh, the return of the joint uh, movement and mm -hmm. make, you know, the muscles are not that uh, tight. So mm -hmm. we, the earlier we intervene, the quicker we intervene after the whiplash, the better the results are. You're right. I know it's, it depends on the degree of the spondylosis. I mean, some of them are mild, others are very severe. So when do we advise people to um, seek medical attention? Because this is a, a very important aspect. We don't want people doing things the wrong way or doing the same thing and getting the same results and they're not going anywhere. At what point would you advise um, our viewers to seek medical attention with their GPs or physiotherapists like you? So now the, the, the general guidelines we have is they apply the heat they prepare the joint and then they move the joint and then they can actually keep a track of the movement uh, so when I say track of the movement mm. uh, in this example if I'm sitting like this my shoulders uh, my back is actually against the chair mm. now I'm looking at to see what point of the room I'm able to look mm. and now I could actually see till here I can look and now I'm doing the exercises same exercises, and then see if it's actually improving a little mm. bit so if at the end of the day, if you do the right things, you get the right results. Mm. So right things means either the improvement in function or improvement in range. Mm. If, we, mm. if I can't look fully up, then I'm doing the heat and doing the exercises, all the three planes we spoke about, looking up, looking down to the sides and tilting your mm. shoulders. If you do that, and then if there is an improvement in the function, so which means that we are heading in the right direction, mm. then we can continue doing that. If you're doing something, if it's not giving us the results that we wanted, and that means that you need professional advice. Mm -hmm. So then uh, that is a time when, you, when you've when you tried uh, these simple things and mm -hmm. it doesn't work, and that is when you probably you need to speak uh, speak to um, the GP uh, or the physiotherapist to, to tailor make mm -hmm. those specific exercises that mm -hmm. suits you. Sometimes you can do the general ones. If the general ones doesn't work for us, then we need specific ones yes. and that can be helped. And uh, talking about the general ones, do you think um, you know, the general exercises we do 
can help with neck pain. You know, you talked about cycling, swimming, yoga, um, you know, dancing. Do you think this might help neck pain in general? Yeah. Yes, doctor. It actually mm. gen generally works on well-being, but out mm. of this few activities that you mentioned, swimming mm. is definitely very, very useful for the neck mm. because when you swim, you're actually moving your neck to full range. Mm. And the, the beauty of being inside the water, we sometimes we refer to as hydrotherapy, mm. where you inside where you inside the water, mm. and then you could move the joint more mm. than as compared to when you're outside the water. Mm. And when people who have got severe uh, uh, you know, long-standing pain conditions. Mm. And once they are inside the pool, swimming pool, and they will actually move the joint so much more. But when they come out of the water and suddenly they feel like they haven't got that moment anymore. Yes. So that's the beauty of being inside the water. Mm. So yes, uh, out of all the activities, swimming is definitely something that uh, people who have got neck pain uh, can, mm. uh, can try. Um, and we need to monitor as always, uh, because I'm not uh, saying this this will for everyone, mm -hmm. because every individual is different. Mm -hmm. But generally, these things should work, and yoga always definitely will work. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen so many people um, doing yoga; they, their posture has been really bad, and within the practice of yoga for, for six months, mm -hmm. and then they actually get really nice posture and all the um, the imbalances that we, a person have between the right and left sides. And they all can be um, uh, can be brought about uh, to a, a proper balance mm -hmm. uh, where there is a harmony between the right and the left sides of the body, mm -hmm. and that is the the best thing that we could do. I know some people talk about uh, neck massage. Do you think um, massaging the neck? Are there conditions in the neck that massage might help? Yes, massage always help, but uh, sometimes these people who are massaging they put too much of uh, uh, pressure and uh, mm -hmm. in terms of making it effective sometimes that can become counterproductive depending mm -hmm. upon what how the joint is without understanding how the joint is underneath mm -hmm. um, so I'm talking about professional massaging yeah. so if uh, somebody is actually doing massage at home, at um, home yes. so I, I don't see that should be a problem see. Oh, right. Absolutely. Provided the massage is helping with the pain. That's it? right, yes. Because you don't want people to be doing massage and it's getting worse and you're still doing the same. And um, I know some cultures well, do the massage their own way. Is it something you encourage or is there a specific way to massage the neck? No, there is no. Uh, obviously, we are mm. looking at improving the blood circulation mm. to the muscles on mm. either side of the neck. Um, and uh, without forgetting the fact that at the base of the skull there mm. are certain, certain muscles. Mm. If, if these muscles are tight, mm. and uh, it can give uh, a person a headache. Mm. Uh, these headaches are referred to as um, tension headaches. Mm. Um, so when people are looking at massaging the muscles, so it starts from the base of the neck and all the way down. Mm. And uh, now you've got lots of lymph nodes uh, mm. on there. So now it's always better to bring from the top down approach mm. where you bring from the top down so that you're actually draining this blood into the right areas rather than right. pushing it up. Right. Uh, pushing it up means you're swimming upstream. Right. So coming down so is you're actually going with the head down. That is uh, that's always better if it is right. starts from the top and then right. it comes down and uh, by doing and it has to be gentle, isn't it? it? Yes, it's got to be because right. there are a lot of uh, sensitive structures underneath uh, all the blood vessels mm -hmm. and nerves and they're all there and we don't want it to be too too much of a pressure. Mm -hmm. At times, if uh, we don't want to, because when somebody else is doing it, we don't know actually how much of uh, yes. pressure they're Very applying. Well. This is something at the back of the neck, it, uh, this is something that we could do, uh, mm -hmm. as long as they, if they don't have any issues with the shoulders, and they can actually feel that much of uh, tension, whatever the tension that they are uh, comfortable with. Or if somebody is doing that, and that communication needs to be there between uh, the person who is doing, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of what they're comfortable with. Uh, yes. So that kind of a dialogue needs to be there. Viewers, I, I mean, I think we will advise that if your child has a neck pain, please don't go massaging. Just take to the uh, professional, the GP, please. Uh, right. So, no, that's that's an important topic. Um, you've dealt with. Um, uh, it's, it, it looks easy. You've made it easy, but neck pain is a very difficult topic, um, Mr. Sham Sati. We um, we're very grateful to you for. Uh, explaining this difficult condition in such a simple way. Uh, viewers, 
you've been listening to the professional uh, who has taken us through the causes of neck pain and some of the things we can do to help ourselves. But please, if you don't understand or if you have pain that is not going away, please contact your doctor or contact a physiotherapist. Usually, everyone will first call their GP. Now, um, I know you have quite a lot to tell us. I'm hoping that in the next uh, show, in the next session, we're going to talk about uh, shoulder pain. Uh, viewers, the next session with uh, this, the health professional will be on shoulder pain. He also has a lot of message to give us. So stay tuned uh, next time to Health Corner and listening to these common conditions and what we can do. We, are, we send our gratitude to you for coming and also we thank as uh, ActiveSX for sponsoring Health Corner. Thank you for being part of the show, Mr. Shamshati. Thank you, Doctor. I really appreciate uh, one more opportunity. I and look forward to for the next one. And thank you to our viewers who have stayed to listen. And please look after yourself and don't do anything you don't understand. Please seek the health professional all the time if you don't know what to do. Thank you very much for being part of today's show. Thank you. Thank you.